My name is John Fall. I'm with Ohio State, and um, and uh, I guess they asked me to talk about yield monitor data. That's an uh, old topic, right? And uh, and I told the other other group my, the message is the same to some degree, but hopefully uh, stop me if you got questions or comments on this. But um, for us, I'll tell you about our situation. Yield monitor data is becoming a much needed much more critical data layer for things happening in the state of Ohio as it relates to the farming uh, fields and, and things and I'll go over that here in a second um, just to point out and I can't speak to, to what's happening here in the Chesapeake Bay necessarily but I know in our neck of the woods services precision ag services continue to grow uh, pretty much all of our retailers, and then we have a, a high number of uh, third-party consultants. The majority, if not all, basically offer some kind of precision ag services, data management type package to growers at some cost. And then there's others too, right? All the seed companies in our area, uh, Bex is a big one, uh, Cortivas, significant. They're all got their packages as well. But in terms of services and things, yield data is becoming very important. And for us, we're, we're kind of just living in this world of environmental stress uh, from the public that now we're starting to use yield monitor data in some newer ways or be forced to use it in some other ways. So I'll go through that. But my point in this is, and this is a little bit dated, that prescriptions and analysis of yield data continues to grow, and that, that parallels at least what's happening in, in the state of Ohio. Okay, and again, a critical data layer there is, is yield data. What's the value of that uh, for most of our growers is, is having that yield data for agronomic. Uh, we'll go through some examples uh, and, and to some degree running a farm business as far as uh, verification and also being able to, to get back quality uh, services from these companies that, that are providing them. The science here, and I know you don't want to hear all this, this is the painful thing is, is that uh, calibration is a necessity, although we're, we're moving in this direction as a, an industry of some auto calibration, okay, deer, I'll mention that here in a little bit, but what I would tell you is we're slowly moving where we maybe don't have to take these painful steps and spend an hour or better trying to calibrate a, a mass flow sensor, okay? But we're not quite all the way there yet. So calibration is a must in order to have a value to data. If my take home message today is if you're going to be using or you're working with growers or you're a grower and want sound agronomic advice is what Bob Nielsen was describing earlier in this room, then you want to take and I would advise you to calibrate your yield monitor and understand why that's so important to maintain spatial, what I call spatial integrity. Okay, we'll come back to these uh, data utilization. What are these yield maps? Uh, these are all being used in Ohio. Again, I'll go through this list in a little bit or in the next slide. I'm of the opinion now, at least because of the services being offered at our growers, uh, most, if not, you know, if I'm a medium or large size grower, I'm using precision ag services on my farm today, at least in Ohio. Um, smaller growers, 500. To 1500 it's a hit or miss okay depending on what they want to spend but if you're not collecting the data and you got a yield monitor I think it's very hard to create and create some of this value back at a field level scenario and that's happening in Ohio we got a lot of growers that will kind of collect data but they never archive it therefore it'll never be at their disposal to use as they interface with folks giving some of the providing some of these services okay so I, I'm of the opinion, you, even if you're not using it today, try and collect quality data. For us, conservation management is becoming huge, where we position things in and around fields, and yield data is becoming a critical input for some of the cost shares that we're seeing in the state of Ohio, and yield data becomes, a critic, like I said, the critical data layer to, to position those conservation structures. So what are we using these for? Um, this isn't an exhaustive list, but I'll just go down through it. These are things that if you're a farmer uh, and you walk into one of these service providers, whether it's a retail co-op to third party, this is what you're going to get 
and this is what they're going to be providing, okay? And not all this is uh, like high adoption, I don't want to say it, uh, but for us, yield data, and it's a significant portion of land in the state of Ohio is informing what gets applied to fields with a prescription. Quite simply, quite simply, basically what happens in those years that I'm not soil sampling, I'm on a four year, whatever rotation on sampling, in between those years, where they're taking yield maps, basically our precision ag providers creating a removal map, okay, and applying for typically two years, two years maintenance type range, okay. That's a, a constant thing. Right now we're getting, you know, probably a lot of fertilizer going on in Ohio. It's, it's relatively similar conditions what you guys got here right now. And I want to say better part, 56% of those prescriptions that are going on are based totally on what was harvest here to here recently, okay? And so <laughs> removal maps, uh, and then that may becoming very important. On-farm research, uh, I told the last group, and I'll talk about this a little bit tomorrow morning. We did a survey, it's probably been two years ago now, of, of farmers. If farmers have precision ag technologies, yield monitors, probably doing variable rate, what percentage of them do you think is doing on-farm research? Quiet group here. Five percent. Eighty-four percent. Technology enables research type things, right? Because you know, and I mean, you guys are shaking your head. I can create a prescription that has embedded whatever kind of project that you want to dream up: strips, blocks, whatever. Put it right in the prescription. Go out, plant it, or spray, apply it, whatever, and. I got a yield monitor now that I can document the yield and it becomes easier. I don't have, you know. So 84% and to be real clear, I want to be clear, this isn't, wasn't to all farmers. These are farmers using precision ag. They have precision ag in-house and are using it. 84% are doing on-farm research. Now I don't know who they're doing research with. That, that was the mistake we made, but they were doing on-farm research. And it was amazing. That number just, I just couldn't believe it myself. It was a, that was one of the more amazing stats out of the survey. But if we're going to do hard farm research, and that's the yield map, and I know you can't see this, but there's some zones there that are drawn, and I'm going to do zone by yield type analysis, I would hope, I would hope that I want to say that at least spatially given, that map's fairly representative relatively of what the yield is across that field. I would hope that would be our goal here, because if it's not, then my zone by yield analysis isn't going to be accurate, okay? So, but we'd have a lot of people doing on-farm research, uh, marketing plans, uh, data aggregation for full farm analysis. A lot of our growers are doing, uh, a lot of our service providers are doing, uh, even at the enterprise level, taking yield maps and basically doing a, a full farm analysis on profit losses. I mean, it's just given in the packages today for some of them. Again, all based on yield maps, not a number that's written down a lot of times. So process and profit yield map, profit mapping's becoming bigger, okay? And, um, and then compaction. And then the other thing at least happened in Ohio is, and this is at a very low, but most of our retail co-op sectors are working with software providers that enable benchmarking. Again, within the benchmarking, yield data becomes a critical data layer to help cross-pollinate those databases in order for me to benchmark. And if you're similar to me, I know how do I compare to my peers, per se. But benchmarking is becoming bit larger and more available to, to, to growers. So, like I said, that's not an exhaustive list. I go through that. But in terms of yield data, those are things that is very common in the state of Ohio that you can buy or are provided through whatever services that are being offered a lot of times from a precision ag perspective. For yield data references and what I get into here next, here's three uh, suggested extension publications if you want to dive into this. Two of these are in Nebraska, okay? You can either follow this link if you have the presentation or put in that, uh, just uh, put in that title. And then this last one is something we put on. And, but if you're in the calibrating yield monitors, I would suggest 
It's not the best thing, I'll be the first to admit, but we wrote up trying to share our experiences of the kind of do's and don'ts that includes using scales on grain carts. How are those properly used to calibrate a yield monitor? For example, don't sit on a 5% slope and take the weight off the cart, you know, kind of scenarios. But those are experiences that we've lived through. But those are things that are all embedded in that that kind of help make sure when you're calibrating you're doing it properly. So just some suggestions on, on some things out there and some of the comments I make, some of the pictures, images I make today are in these, in these uh, fact sheets. On our website, if you ever need it, uh, on our digital ag slash precision ag, we have a whole page that uh, offers uh, harvest information, including we try and maintain a, a listing of calibration sheets. Most of you may know if you're writing a combine, kind of a two-page thing, what's the procedure that you have to go through? You take a John Deere combine, I do the vibration, the temperature, then the mass flow, moisture, all that in kind of a sequence. Those, those kinds of things, if it's lost or there, can be downloaded, printed, and be available when you go through that. So enough of that. Data quality. That's what I'm here talking about. Why is this topic so important? Um, few things. I, I got two that we're going to talk about today in red. I'll let you read those, but it boils down to calibration and management of that combine slash yield monitor and combination. And then missing field data. Uh, that's a common thing. Uh, told the last group, we last year we had yield data coming in on projects and 15% of the field, up to 40% of the field sometimes weren't, weren't there, wasn't available. Well, that kind of messes, at least it messed us up, especially if it's happening in the area where we're doing the projects. So there's a lot of causes of this data quality. And if you work in this space, you understand, I think you understand my comments, but it continues to be an issue, the ability to collect and have quality data available to do field level analysis off the machines that are being used today. And for yield data, it comes down to, are you managing it properly? Are you calibrating it properly in order to get quality data to put into some of these analysis to do the things I talked about on that previous slide, all those different things. With that said, here's the errors. This is what I hear. I just wrote these down. I've calibrated. I've checked it with my scale weights. I'm within 1% or 2%. So my calibration is good. I think that's a facade, that's, that's potentially a false statement. Most of the yield monitors, calibrated or uncalibrated, I can get the accumulated mass pretty good on a field. But if you want to do subfield analysis, that spatial component be becomes important, and that number right there doesn't reflect what the spatial quality of the map coming off could be. That does not tell you that. It just tells me I was able to accumulate, you know, 100,000 pounds, 200,000 pounds off a field, and relatively it was accurate to what was delivered to the elevator or to your, to your scales uh, before putting a bin. That's all that says. It says nothing about the spatial integrity of the maps that are going to be coming out. It's a good indicator. I would want that, but spatially you've got to take other steps to ensure that that accuracy is maintained. So what's your intentions for using yield maps? For most in the discussion today is I want to maintain the spatial integrity. And second, if we're going to go to that route, I would, I would argue based on our research and our continuous use of yield maps to drive our research program that the data has to be clean before it's put through a process, converted into a prescription, for example. How many people are doing that? I don't know. Someone asked me that in the last, last session. How many people were actually cleaning the yield data before it's processed into whatever's being delivered? Prescription map is an example. We'll get to that. But basically removing, a ring, what's that? Well, then I can't answer your question. I don't know what you mean by cleaning. Cleaning the yield data is basically removing erroneous data from the map so spatially it's in, accurate. Okay? So cleaning would, in my mind, taking erroneous data or correcting things that you know are an error and correcting it 
to be right. Yep, and so we'll go through some of that. That's exactly right. So, we'll, so cleaning means just the yield map alone. I download it from climate, I download it from deer, and I'm taking it verbatim, and I'm just pushing out the other end a prescription map. That's a dangerous business to be in if you're paying for it. For them, it doesn't matter. But you're paying for it and expect sound agronomy to be done, right? If you expect that, then cleaning is a, to me is an important step. We'll get to, I'll try and explain more. Two overlooked issues these days, at least in our neck of the woods. Someone comes to me, Jake, you want, you want, and they don't have multiple year yield data. They either don't know where the yield data is, it's not on the card, they never archived it, they don't have, and that's, that's pretty frequent. Okay, it never got archived. Therefore, I don't have four years of corn data over eight years that can be used in some kind of algorithm, whatever's being used to create the prescription. That's one of the big problems that we continue to face. And then within that is this poor quality yield data that we'll talk about or what I'll try and highlight here in a second. So what's happened? So a few things, and we'll get to the comments over here because they're good comments. Number one, you go back 20 years. Let's think about that. What size combine were most of the yield monitors used to Precision planning is a recent development. I'll give you that. But everyone in this room recognizes the, the number one used yield monitor in the U.S. mass flow sensor is Ag Leader, right? If you're running a, a, a red combine for, for multiple years, you've used an Ag Leader mass flow sensor, and what they produce is their moisture sensor on the side of the clean grain elevator, you've used that. If you're a green operator, if you've got an S-series combine, you have an ag leader mass flow sensor and an ag leader built moisture sensor on the side of your clean grain elevator. Okay? Or if you're just an ag leader and you put that on as a, as a thing, majority of the yield monitors, at least in my neck of the woods, are running ag leader components. The second thing that most people are running in our state is precision planning. It sounds like that's not prevalent out this way, but in Ohio, precision planning is, is somewhat gospel in terms of what goes on the planner and ultimately it's a sales to get the uh, yield monitor on there. So at the end of the season, I have my analysis right there in my Field View Cab app. That's pretty popular. Those are the two most popular, okay? So, but in that, in the last 20 years, what's happened to our quality of our yield data? It's gone down. It used to be the, the, the highest resolution data that you could collect on fields was probably yield data. You get 20,000, 100,000 points per field per year. But today, to your point, I'm going to assume we got quite a few 40-foot platform headers running around out here. Probably got a lot of 12-foot corn headers running, maybe eight. And the other difference was back when the Ag Leader was developed, and I'm not getting on Ag Leader about this, but just think about the changes that have been made even in the last 10 years all those things were built for what class combine? Five and six. Five and six. What are we using today? Eights and nines. Eights and nines. Anyone notice a difference in the clean grain elevator? Anyone know a difference in the, the mass flow sensor? Same sensor, pretty much. But my point in that is I'm not saying, I just want you to recognize that size and the portion of the grain flow has changed in what we're sensing, okay? And today, what, I can get high resolution imagery, I can get high resolution planning data, and guess what's been our limiting factor in recent years of data on a field? Yield data. It's probably as low resolution based on, at least that's been our event. Maybe you'll get to this, but do you see that replacing yield data in the future? Can we yeah. say that to the end? Because that's a good question. The question is, I think, remote sense imagery yeah, or something. Yeah. Does that help? And we can, I'll touch on that right at the end. So, but anyways, my point is we have changed the table. It used to be yield data was the most accurate, or most highest resolution. Today, depending on where you're at and what you have access to, it's probably the least, could be the least resolution data. 
So I can't see sub planter, whether it's 40 foot, 60 foot planters, I can't see sub planter type impacts. Take pinch row compaction, for example. You hear that comment a lot. I can't measure that with a, yield, uh, a grain yield monitor today. But do you think the precision, now the precision, you know, they're, they're weighing in that bucket elevator, that clean grain elevator, instead of using the impact plate at the top. Do you think they're getting better resolution with that over the aggregate? Let me come to that too. Make sure you understand what you're saying. But I, they are using an impact sensor. The bucket is there for a different reason. The impact sensor, and I'll show a picture of that real quick, make sure we're clear on that. But it's, it's relatively the same as the Ag Leader, just positioned a little bit differently. And it holds calibration better, the precision holds calibration better than the Ag Leader. Yep, now talk about that. Yeah, yeah, those are good points. Anyways. You get my point. So going back to the comment over here, what's that area right there? What that is that area right there? That's the hydrostat. That's not the not the mass flow sensor or yield monitor. That's navigating through the field. I gotta slow down real quick, speed up, and all of a sudden the, the area changes relative to mass flow, so I get a radius data. So my point is if you don't remove that, it's it's an artifact there. Okay, and I'll show you on the next slide. The other thing is, everyone knows this area right here. See how I'm operating in the point rows? Everyone knows those are reds. You think that's really reflective of the true yield in that area? Everyone know why those are red? What's that? Half width. Half width or partial width. I'm coming out of a point row and I'm not changing the width of cut. I'm still taking, in, and the yield monitor thinks I'm taking a full, so the mass flow is being partitioned over the full width versus half, quarter as I move out of those point rows, and that dramatically impacts the calculations when I convert that into some kind of prescription removal map or something like that. And lastly, and I'll come back to another one, but you get these end of row areas, these turning areas, again, aren't reflective of the yield right there, but they're artifacts there that if they're not removed, get averaged in, and guess what? I know probably a few of you will argue with me sitting in here and go, well, they just kind of all average out. I'll argue with you and I can show you evidence. It can drastically change the map and can drastically change ultimately what that map gets converted into in terms of prescription. It can change. There is a publication out there that talks about clean versus unclean yield maps that says your zones that you would create from a yield map will change by 40% of clean versus unclean, and that's on average. That's a pretty, think about your zones changing when you do a multi-year type analysis or however type analysis that you're creating, but that d demonstrates cleaning is an important step. GPS. Basically, if you go to go do something for a little bit and come back to, you got that drift in some of those. And so to your point, the quality of the correction signal can have a bearing on erroneous data too. Yes. Absolutely. And I would tell you, remind me when I come back, you know, all these systems now do the coverage maps, so I don't have that problem. It basically looks at the coverage maps, and for every point collected it looks, what it thinks is hasn't been harvested and calculates that area and assigns it to that point. If you got a lot of drift to your point, then you can have errors in that area calculation and we've seen some, some problems with that, especially on WAS receivers. So that's a good point. So this is pretty common. I mean, this is a 40 foot 
uh, Draper. This is uh, one of our research combines that, that we're running. But again, as we think about that, you think about all the averaging, and everyone knows it takes how long to go from the tip of that header up into the mass flow sensor? Somewhere on average 11 to 13 seconds. Meaning as it gets harvested out here, transmitted up through the feeder house, through the threshing unit, drops out the bottom, up the clean grain elevator, that's somewhere, depending on the, on the combine, 11 to 13 seconds on average. So a lot of average in, besides going big, going on to get that one mass flow measurement, or a mass flow sent, uh, measurement. So let's go back to this map. So everyone has this in their mind, some of the, what this map looks like. So if I'm a company, or if I'm trying to do it internal to my farm, and I'm going to create a prescription map, the first thing I'm going to have to make a decision is I've got to either grid that yield, or I have to contour that yield in order to come up with, we'll say, the prescription at the end of the, the process here. Okay, the question is clean versus unclean. Clean versus unclean. Hopefully I'm making sense of what clean means. I'm sorry about that. So this is the raw data. This is this map right here, and we're trying to make a fertility prescription out of it. That's what we're doing for this farmer. And I gridded it over here at 50-foot grids, just arbitrarily picked. It's some t relatively common sometimes. And then I also contoured. All this is just done in SMS. All right? So that's what the, just taking that data right there and gridding it on 50 foot, basically, or contouring, that's what the map looks like. If I clean all that erroneous data out, those point rows, I know that there's where I stopped or accelerated or deaccelerated, which happens. It just naturally happens for whatever reason, rocks whatever might be in the field. When I take those out, I basically took all that erroneous data out and recreated those maps. Do you guys see a difference in those maps? Absolutely. There should be several areas that pop out to you spatially. Not all areas change, but there is a change in the way that looks. And that is what I'm saying is, if you're not taking this step, you're going to have some underestimates of yield in some areas before you go into whether it's removal map or however that map's being used for the process, analytical process, profit map, whatever. Okay? So though, that's one example. Uh, one field, one example. I'll come back and show you one at the end as well that we're doing uh, on one of our research farms. But hopefully that's kind of getting my point about this kind of cleaning comment, taking errors out and getting it correct, corrected spatially. Every combine has a, a combination. Everything's different. This is kind of one of those things. So this is this combine. Kind of think of the, me running it versus Jake running it. Are we going to run that combine the same way? Absolutely not. And if the result of that is what that mass flow sensor is estimating as mass flow is going to change the way we operate that combine. Right? There's operators and there's drivers. Okay? A lot of us are probably drivers, maybe not operators. Okay? I know I'm a driver some days, especially when we're down to crunch time. You become a driver. But the point is... These proof, this is just a distribution of speed over the same field. Kind of think of taking every other pass and harvesting, throwing a new driver in. And we all operate at that system. The result of that is a different yield map. Just slightly different type of yield map comes out because of that. Just be aware of that. So if I'm not calibrating it for me, and Jake's not calibrating it for him, or we calibrate for one but not the other, there could be some differences. Just throwing that out for everyone. This is what's out there. And so I'm going back to your comment. This is the Ag Leader. If you got one of those old 9600s, 9610s, 30s, those have those old John Deere plates. You remember how many calibration points that you needed for those? One, then they went to two. But it was very few, if you remember. But 
Ag leader uses four to six. So if you're a deer case or an ag leader user, you're probably going to be doing four to six points per uh, calibration. And then there's your precision planning, all mounted up here on the top of the, 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 the clean grain elevator. Okay, so that's the mass flow sensor that, that precision planning came out with, impact style. What I want you to think about, I thought I, just uh, real quick, I'm not going to talk about this. We can have a whole other discussion. If you're a challenger, I don't know if challenger to, is out here much, quote Kloss, they all use optical sensors. That brings a whole different set of uh, pieces in. But what I want you to understand today is we do not calibrate a yield monitor to bushels per acre. Bushels per acre is a calculation of the yield monitor. What we measure, okay, and let me use ag leader, what we measure, try to estimate, is pounds per second flow that then gets converted into and calculated into bushels per acre estimate for every point. Now I think that's important because a lot of people talk about, well, I'm going to clean my, clean my uh, uh, yield data, I got a bunch of errors in it, so I'm just going to throw anything above 300 bushel out and anything below 50 bushel out. And my point is, do you know what really caused the errors in that calculation? It's not the bushels per acre, it's not the yield that's in error, it's one of the measurements that was used to calculate yield. In this case, mass flow sometimes. But mass flow, very simply, and I want to show you this, is, and this is very simple, trying to keep this up. As this deflects, basically the voltage output of that sensor, you get a voltage output and we try and calibrate that voltage output to a pounds per second flow measurement. Voltage, pounds per second. We're not calibrating the bushels per acre, we're calibrating pounds per second flow to a voltage output of the sensor. Okay? You'll notice I don't talk a lot about moisture sensors in this, in this discussion because if it's properly cleaned and properly calibrated, they, they, they will give you accurate moisture sensors. That's a whole different business. But the mass flow, okay, in this, it's actually pounds per second, and that is what we need to be cali calibrating for. So this is a typical, this is an actual output to one of the sensors I've showed you is Voltage output versus pounds per second. I'm going to assume most of you have never seen this chart before. Voltage output on the x-axis, pounds per second on the y-axis, and it's the calibration of that. You see two points there. In this case, trying to draw a line between the two points to calibrate the yield monitor, or mass flow sensor, excuse me. Anything unique about that mass flow sensor that jumps out? not linear. So that should tell you right now, I can't do it with one point. Can I do it with two points? Nope. I'm going to have to do it with four or six points given what the recommended. I would encourage more the better in order to map out this right here. Now, going back to my point about Jake and I driving the same combine with the same calibration what I would tell you is this will slightly change when I'm in a combine versus when Jake's in a combine. This nonlinear response is the same. People argue with me sometime on this. Doesn't matter what yield monitor you're using, if it's a mass flow sensor, that's the type of output. There is no linear output of a mass flow sensor on the market today. Does that make sense? So if you're doing one point, you're not going to calibrate the mass flow sensor. Does everyone kind of get what I'm saying on that? Over here is a list, okay? And we've done um, several tests. What I would tell you is what impacts that slope or that curve on there? Grain moisture. Grain moisture is a significant. Most of you probably already know that. So what does that tell you? Well, most all of us know I need a high moisture corn curve and a low moisture corn curve. Pretty obvious. Roughly the middle of that, I would tell you if you're running above 20, 
have something above 20, anything below 20, have a, what I would consider a, a lower moisture or low moisture corn calibration curve. Soybeans, our neck of the woods, we typically can get by with one, but our variation in moisture content as it relates to soybeans I mean, we're between 11 and 16% relatively most days. Sometimes we'll get down to 10 and 9, but most of the time we're not changing that much in a field or as the harvest season goes on. And so we relatively can get by with one calibration. Makes sense for everyone? But grain moisture, a significant change in grain moisture will influence that curve that you see. Okay? Secondly, test weight. Test weight, and we'll get back to your point in a little bit. Anyone in here change their test weight or recalibrate when you have a significant change in test weight? Anyone in here do that? I doubt it. I have a question on this. What, what is going on uh, this calculation when you might go out and run a true calibration but then start adding true weights back into the Combine. Is that adding points along that the whole time? Or yep. Yep. I'll show you that in the next, okay. next slide, what happens. But you're at basically trying to get a point, and you get enough points over flow, a, a range of flows. We, we think about it in bushels, but really it needs to be pounds per second mm -hmm. over a width of flows in order to map that curve for that combine operator combination. Yeah. Like as the moisture and the test weight as everything changes, there's more loads being put in. Can be put in. But what I'll tell you is what we found uh, in our research is a, a plus or minus two point movement in test weight requires a new calibration. I mean, you get to operate in potentially plus 10% and not know it. So my example is if I'm doing corn and I calibrate at 56 <clears throat> roughly 56 pounds per bushel on my test weight, I'm pretty good between 54 and 58. If I get in really good corn, it's high test weight, 59, 60. If you're really serious about this, you very want to be recalibrated. That curve moves. That's the influence of that. Uh, combine roll, just throw this out. Combine roll, so if I'm moving, we're thinking this way. Does that influence the mass flow sensor? Sure but it's very minimal because they account for it, okay? So roll typically isn't as much of an influence. It can be, you know, if I'm running on 2% slope and I jump up to 10% slope, no doubt about it. That's a significant change. But for most of, I'm assume, whatever we calibrate, we're not gonna be making a huge difference in our roll. However, what do you think about pitch? Pitch has a huge impact on mass flow sensing. And quite frankly, what all it is is you're going downhill, you got gravity working kind of on the grain, going uphill against it, the angle's changing, how that, that grain's coming over and can have a tremendous impact. So if I'm sitting in here and I'm working with Jake and I'm, we're doing a test plot, do I want to go up and down or across to harvest and plant and harvest it? Across. Because I'm assuming most of you are going to start left, or, you know, you're going to be doing adjacent passage. You're not going to go back to, unless you're going to go back to the same end and do the same direction every time, you got to go across to minimize the effect of that. So just some points and all that. So back to your comment, okay. And we'll skip this, but everyone's a little bit different. The more, the merrier. And when I tell everyone, I'm going to project most everyone in here probably only calibrates this. They never get low enough, and they never really get high enough to really map out. But it's somewhere in between, and that's what you're doing. So when you do your speed or width of cut changes, what you're really trying to do is map out and put a curve on that, on that line for that operator per se, specifically to the, mainly the combine, but the operator as well, trying to map that out. And when you get all that flow, if you can get across expected flow, you're gonna do a good job and get quality spatial yield data. 
What ha like I said, most people don't get down in here too much. Never get down here and be able to map this out. They end up calibrating between here and here. I can see you some, some things that shows that. Shows that. How do you get down to that level? Well, you got to drive really slow. That's a pain in the ass. No one wants to sit around filling a tank for one hour, right, just to get 4,000, 8,000 pounds, whatever it is that you need. But the point is, if you're really serious about it, and what I talk about in corn, if I'm going to go out and calibrate corn, I'm kind of 150 and 180, but in this case, I know in our neck of the woods, because of the, the spring we had, we can be 200 bushel in the field and 50 bushel. I'm going to tell you that 50 bushel, there's a good chance that's plus or minus 10 to 20 percent off because we never calibrated down that area. That's what I'm saying. Okay? How do you do that? My suggestion to you, every yield monitor has a screen that actually gives you a pounds per second output. Look at the pounds per second and make sure you're getting down to low flow rates or getting yourself adjusted down to flow low flow rates and make sure you're over the full range of expected for the field. Does that make sense? But every display can give you pounds per second and that would be the important thing to make sure that I'm getting low to high and I'm, I'm calibrating to your point earlier. <coughs> Lastly, and to your point, this is what Precision Plan did. Precision Plan did two things for everyone in this room. Number one, it made a clean grain elevator, which had been out for a while, just no one used it, that has paddles that are the same shape and size and form. Is that important? Yeah, what is most of our clean grain elevator um, made out of? Tires, old tires. So the shape of every one of those tires, every one of those paddles is different, which again affects how that grain's accelerated to hit one of those sensors. They removed that variable from, we've always known that, it just was too costly. They moved that, so they added that in, to, to, your, to your point. Secondly, you can have this option of a grain property kit, basically for every rotation of the clean grain elevator, they can begin to assess or recalibrate as changes in test weight occur. So that's an advantage they brought to the table if you're using this. So as the grain characteristics, physical characteristics change, moisture, test weight, those kinds of things, they can account for those changes and update that calibration on the go essentially. So that's an advantage to that. But again, that sensor is at the top of the mass flow. All that is is feedback to the, the algorithm in the in the 2020 per se that's calculating what ultimately is the mass flow measurement. Okay, so that's something that's out there to consider. John Deere has active yield. If you have a new S series combine, it's basically a seven. I think it's fairly common on sevens today. You can put it on some of the old sixes. You'll see that configuration in the tank. What is that? Basically, it's a way to auto calibrate the machine and not have to go through this low to high speed or partial widths to calibrate. They are constantly updating their calibration with this technology. You're seeing other companies trying to bring this to similar things to market. So the idea here is I don't have to calibrate, the system auto calibrates itself. What I would tell you today is if you're serious about doing kind of on-farm research and you got a project that's very valuable to you, I would still do the routine, basic, four to six point calibration. This is nice, especially for folks that don't like to calibrate it on previous yield data, but it will never replace or has not been able to replace the calibration procedures that are in basically developed by Ag Leader today. Lastly, and again, Ag Leader is just one example, but if you got John Deere, basically going back to your point earlier, this auto calculation of, of harvested area per point it, auto, it does that, and that gets you away from that point row issue that we saw. Rather than having to, you know, hit the display and say, no, I'm not taking 12, I'm 10, I'm 8, I'm 6, I'm 2, whatever, moving in and out. I don't have to sit there and do this. Basically, this will automate that area calculation so as you get out of point row or, or work in areas that aren't consistently full header width, it, it accounts for that. Given that you're using a quality correction signal. I think that's a very valid point that you brought up earlier. We have seen some issues with some things on that end. So lastly, and I'll leave it to this, maybe we'll have time for a question or two. Here's a recent, uh, basically we're doing a fertility planning uh, on this field. Um, there's the raw yield map. 
I'm going to say most of you probably have seen something like that if you've been playing around. You can see the turning errors. There's also this error out here based on trying to navigate basically the hydrostat comment earlier. And then lastly, you can see in this case this kind of last pass line down through there that again was an area issue. We removed that. I removed less than 10% of the points in that field to make that center map. But what you'll notice is it significantly begins to change the quality, the spatial integrity of that map. Okay? I can't tell you, the question came up, most everyone uses this map and it's just a quick routine without cleaning. I would encourage you if you're serious about agrono doing agronomics on a field that you might want to be visiting with those companies understanding what they're doing to help clean that data or correct that data. I can't speak to what all is being done out there. In some cases for us, we, have to, we do it ourselves. We have our own algorithms and, and ways that we clean it before it gets passed to what you see there is a removal map. That's a P205 map. There'd be a K20 that ultimately gets put into a two-year replacement routine for potash and, in our case, map. Okay, it gets converted to a prescription. So with that, that's all I have to say. Uh, lastly, if you want to see some of our research, we have an eFields book. Actually, we just started working on a 19. It comes out in January. If you're interested, get a hold of me or we'll get one of our teams. I'm happy to send that to you. For Ohio, but it covers technology to agronomic type stuff. Um, some similar things to what Mr. Dr. Nilsson talked about, but uh, it's something we're happy to share with you. Comes out January 8th, the 19 version of this. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Any questions? Two minutes, Jake says we got before five o'clock, right? We don't know what five o'clock. Any comments, questions? Yes, sir. Sorry. It might be a dumb question. When you clean the, the, when you clean the map, how do, how do you got the program to do it? Are you just taking it out? Do you think it's a list? Do you want? The question is how do we clean maps? So, um, first of all, I look a couple things I'll give out. I look at moisture as one variable because, again, moisture is measured. And those sensors regardless of whoever's using it, are only good from about 8 9% up to about 32 33%. So if there's a moisture point in there that's like 40 50 which isn't typical, usually it's on the lower end. It'll be 5 6 You don't know what the moisture is, and we remove it. Typically, that's very few points. So that's one thing that we go through and do immediately. It just says, at that point, we don't know what the moisture was. We don't try and look around. We just get rid of it. Mass flow, we look at mass flow and we look at the combine model and know what the limitations, because if mass flow is like 85 pounds per second, the combine can't push that much through it. So it's gone, it's erroneous, and you don't know how to correct it. So we look at that, we can look at speed to look at these quick changes. You can look at that real easily based on speed, you know, what, what kind of change. And a lot of times the, the yield in that vicinity is a lot different and we can auto select those and, and we remove those. The turnings get a little bit harder. I, I don't know you guys up here. We do not just throw out zero pounds for bushel data just to throw out zero pounds because sometimes that is, especially a year like this where we had a wet spring, there's drown out areas. Guess what the yield was? Zero. That's us. So what we do is we look at the turning, basically the bearing, and we can, we can a lot of times select where you get that double, you know, you get the headlands, we want to retain that. These typically turning happen at a different time and we can look at the bearing and we, we remove the, the turning aspects out, that, those red points very, typically very easily. Does that make sense? And so that, our routine doesn't get all of them. You probably saw a few reds that just keep, but it's a lot better than what it was. And, yeah, you can, I guess, throw darts at me, but that's... we completely throwing them out? Gone. They're gone. Less than 10% of the points in that map are removed. What about adjusting the values? Gone. And the point is, I don't know what the, the measured value is. So you'd be better off not having it than taking That's, I mean, I don't know what it's... Yeah, so ultimately the yield ends up. So a lot of times when you see, this is... My point, a lot of times when you see 
500 bushel corn. It's not, it's, it's either mass flow or typically area calculations, the result of that. That's what caused the 500. And so if the area is wrong, we could be able to adjust that, but a lot of times we just throw it out because we've got enough yield points around it. We can work. I throw out 20 points in an area, I still got 100, 200 of them around. I can still do a good, it's still going to do a nice analysis. When you look at this last year you guys just went through, next year you go to do your multi-year yield analysis, does this year go into it or not? <laughs> So that's why I sit back there when Mr. N Dr. Nelson was talking is we're not sure what we're going to learn from this year. Right. I, I mean, we struggle with that on whether it's a field like a replant issue or whatever, you know, most of the time you figure you may as well kick it out because you just, it's almost as bad as those red dots there, unless it was truly something that you feel like is going to be repeatable. Yeah. So his point is, is, at least in our neck of the woods in Ohio, we, we didn't get corn planted till June. We got beans in some areas planted. Well, uh, and, you know, it's t atypical. It may be normal, but we'll care, classify as you'll atypical. You the data, but you just may not use it for Yeah. Purposes. I mean, is that the way you look at it or not? So we normally will archive every year's yield data. We're into that. We, we believe in that. Archive that display data before we even clean it. I, we keep a copy of every yield map and keep that hidden over, or not hidden, but archived over here. We make a copy of that and then we do our cleaning algorithm so we can always go back. And I bet if you came to our farm or came to our database, that's what you'd want. You wouldn't want what we clean because we may not be able to, you might have a different algorithm. But it, whether you keep it or not, I, I don't know. We're struggling on that. How do we select some of that data? So, um, so sometimes we'll em, em, employ a three standard deviation if you want to talk statistics. So anything outside that three standard deviation will get removed. Um, normally, we go through the process. Again, I'm not saying we're dead on. We go through the process and look at the mass flow. We look at the, the, the moisture and make sure it all is within the reasons, the reasonable ranges that we expect. Not saying it's accurate first. And a lot of times that will get rid of in these, these spatial things like the turning errors. Get rid of all those. That'll take care of a lot of that. So when you get into that whole statistics, what to remove, if you are going to move, Sometimes we'll catch some of the things that don't get done in that filtering process, but a lot of times getting rid of those error points uh, minimizes this a statistical process. I'm not saying that's accurate, but we will employ sometimes a three standard deviation selection. On on, on and we're when I say that I'm doing that on mass flow or I'm doing that on moisture, not yield because that's what's measured. Yields calculated. It's five o'clock. <laughs> Thanks.